also from the San Francisco Bay Area, but now I've been uh, teaching in Vermont for the last several years. And uh, I, when I first was introduced uh, to this uh, kit by BioRad, I was immediately uh, intrigued by it because I knew right from the get-go that something special was going on. Um, I want to talk to you today about um, the various activities that are found in the kit. And I also want to walk you through the neuroscience involved in, uh, in addiction and reward pathways and show you how students can become not only engaged with the, um, the laboratory activities, but gain awareness uh, if if I were to say what what's my favorite part about this uh, this activity, it's students having taught this the last couple of years in my class. Students think that this is one of their favorite uh, activities, and we do a lot of biotech in class. And when when I say favorite, it's not necessarily because it's particularly joyful, but it, it's one of their favorite activities because it really is so relevant. And it it's so concerning and, and so emotional. And they, they're they able to understand something that's going on, not only in the United States, but in the, in the world. And they're able to understand their potential role as, as a future biologist, that they can handle this type of epidemic that's going on and basically understand the role of a scientist and, and how they conduct research and uh, and be able to understand what's happening uh, in current events in the news. It's really powerful. And so I'm going to talk to you about um, opioids in general and fill you in and background. You might have background in it and the reward pathway and some neuroscience and some of the uh, factors, environmental factors that are that influence dependence. And this is, I'm, I'm going to basically walk you through some, the, the approach that you might take uh, with your students, because the kid is designed this way. The first activity is to sort of get into the background of, of neuroscience, and then talk about how doctors currently assess risk for uh, prescribing opioid medication. And then um, doctors are concerned because they're choice to prescribe medication could lead to addiction. And so uh, scientists looking into this decided to develop a, a real life genetic research uh, study in which they took control uh, individuals and case study individuals that were addicted to heroin in a, in a similar uh, cohort uh, control and looked at that and, and the students walk through that uh, opportunity. And then students are able to uh, take samples uh, without the need uh, of a PCR. And so these are samples that come in the kit that are DNA that have already been pre-amplified. And so they run uh, agarose gel electrophoresis. And the results of that lead to genotypes that will uh, suggest whether or not there is a an allele association with uh, opioid addiction, and, and, and I'll be talking about that. And the students determine allele frequencies, uh, and they look at statistics, and then finally they they look at the, uh, the their confidence of the, of the data that they've collected and where we're going to go next. And so it's the full package in terms of like, like what you would want from a dynamic lesson. It's relevant, it's engaging, it's hands-on, uh, there's uh, data that's collected that supports claims and uh, the students are able to uh, participate in it. And so it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And so the first few things that I want to talk about are what's going on in terms of uh, the number of deaths that are caused by opioids uh, in the United States. It's been rising over the last uh, couple of decades. And the, this graph is uh, it goes back to 2017, but it's also current that the number of opioid deaths and drug-related deaths are exceeding other uh, sorts of 
uh, deaths, like for example, gun related and vehicle crashes. And so just in 2020, uh, 92,000 deaths from drugs, 75% of those were involved in opioid. Um, just the other day, I was looking this up uh, on CNN and the overdose, the overdose deaths uh, continue to rise. And this year, 2023, is another terrible year uh, for this, and more than 111,000 people. Uh, and so the numbers are increasing, uh, and it's important to engage the students. Uh, it's it's on the media a lot, and I just put a few things up here. Like if you're familiar with the uh, Purdue Pharma that produced um, a lot of these opioids, uh, the the Sackler family ha has been through lawsuits and, and, and is settling. There's things on, on NPR that you can have students listen to. Uh, currently, there's a really popular series going on on Netflix called Pain Killer. Uh, and I put a link over here. I don't necessarily need to play it, but it's the it's the trailer to that series showing the uh, a dramatic portrayal of the Sackler family. And, you know, um, how did we get here? Um, let me show you a little bit, uh, the sh a very short video, because I think it's important. Um, doctors uh, years ago uh, started to increase their their prescriptions for opioids because there was a movement, and again, it was related to the pharmaceutical companies, that pain needed to be managed. And a long story short, there, uh, some of the studies suggesting that the opi opioids were not as addictive were false. And so uh, let me show you this and show you a little bit about what, what I'm trying to get at here. Let's see. Let's see if I can play that. By the way, while this is loading up, if you have any questions or comments at any time, feel totally welcome to uh, to jump right in on that. Where does pain relief end and opioid addiction begin? We began teaching people that pain was bad and that we can get rid of it. And you have a right to not be in pain. This was what drove a whole new wave of addiction because those initial small studies were simply wrong. Small studies from big pharmaceutical companies that claimed high-powered painkillers were safe and that there was minimal risk of becoming addicted, leading to a wave of over-treating chronic pain. But what's happening is many, many people are experiencing profound side effects. Those include addiction, serious respiratory complications, limited concentration over time, fatigue, and the chance for increased feelings of depression. And over time, patients may start to feel trapped by the pills they were once given to make them feel better. They are incredibly valuable medications, but only for a short term and for targeted purposes. Typically safe short term opioid uses include surgical patients and trauma patients. Also, opioids can be safely used to treat terminal palliative care patients suffering severe pain and cancer patients with pain that won't respond to other medications. Even then, it's important to know we're living in a whole new world of addiction. The wealthy, the working classes, daughters, sons, mothers, fathers, grandparents, who are all becoming addicted. And it has had a profound impact on our society. Yeah, and I, I would add, you know, it's setting the stage for for this uh, for this activity and and for the work is really valuable. It's really time that's that that goes a long way because once the students feel emotionally uh, attached to this, because there's a lot of misconception about addiction and and uh, pain medication there's like a general feeling just in general about uh, patients not having the willpower to stop or there's some sort of you know foul play involved in these kinds of medications and i you know i, I mentioned that i teach in vermont and and the vermont's a very small state and um, the these numbers don't seem like a lot but 
but they're increasing and it, and it gets the student's attention. And uh, a couple of years ago, I heard uh, on NPR and on Terry Gross on Fresh Air, she was interviewing an author, his name, uh, Travis, and he's a professor at John Hopkins University. And it was about opioids. And I was like, oh, maybe I, sh I should listen to this. And he was describing how, do you remember in the video, it said that they're, they're, the opioids work very well for to stop pain and they're really important. And so this professor was riding his motorcycle as he did every day to school and a, and a truck uh, went through a red light and hit him and crushed him severely and broke many of his bones and his ankles and his, and his feet were crushed. And so he was thankful uh, that he was on very strong opioids. But as it turns out, the doctors were prescribing it over and over. And then he switched from uh, from one physician to another physician and he became addicted to it. And he wrote this book called In Pain. And um, it, it, was, it was remarkable uh, reading about how a, this professor talked about how an ordinary person uh, who is taking this medication has a very difficult time tapering from it. And he, uh, through further study, realized that there was addiction in his family. And that's where I want to go with this, this conversation. And that doctors want to know, is there a, a potential genetic marker in a patient that can help them guide whether or not they should uh, prescribe the opioid medication or not. And so I just want to point that out. And so a little background on the brain. And so what we're, we're talking about here is the classic reward pathway. It's the mesolimbic system in the brain. It starts off with um, opioids. They stimulate a region in the brain called the, the ventral uh, tegmental area or VTA. And the, the key neurotransmitter here is dopamine. And so dopamine then sends signals to other parts of the brain, including the nucleus incumbens, and then ultimately it gets to the frontal cortex. And there's two things that are going on with, with this dopamine. It's, it's, it's lowering pain, but it's also feelings of euphoria. And the reward pathway is important, obviously, evolutionarily speaking, because things that feel good, things that that are pleasurable need to be uh, reproduced. In other words, things that are good. Uh, boy, I really like that. I, I'm going to continue to do that. And so opioid kind of fits right into that wheelhouse in terms of um, when something's feeling good, we're going to become uh, more likely to want to repeat it. And so opioids reduce pain. And I want to talk about that. And they're also part of this uh, activate the reward pathway. And I want to talk about that as well. So what, what, I'm look, what you're looking at here is a cartoon drawing of the end of a neuron. This is the axial uh, terminal right here. And these little green balls are vesicles that contain neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter uh, in, in this conversation is, is dopamine. And what's interesting is these little stars are opioids. And when they bind to a receptor protein, an opioid receptor protein, that causes the, the neurotransmitter to be released from and into the synapse where it's picked up by a dendrite of a, of a different neuron and, and it's picked up by a dopamine receptor protein. And so this is how uh, the signal gets transported from one neuron to another. But if you ask the students this fundamental question, like why would the body have an opioid receptor protein? I mean, when you when you look at the origin, I'm not going into this, but I think you may know that the origin of these the, the class of opioids comes from the poppy plant, and so like what 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 is going on with that? And so you may know that uh, they're sometimes surprised with this, and it, and it brings up the conversation of endorphins, which are naturally produced in dopamine as well. These are both chemicals that make your your body feel happy, but they function in different ways, meaning that the the endorphins um, relieve pain naturally, and so when they attach to the receptor protein, there, you know, there are receptor proteins, if, as you can see in the, in the diagram, for endorphins. But that portion 
action of the molecule, the natural endorphin and, and, and morphine uh, are very similar. And so they bind to the same receptor protein. And so they have the, the ability to bind to our neuron. And so the reward pathway has to do with the fact that when dopamine is, uh, is being released normally, it is regulated by another neurotransmitter called GABA. GABA is a chemical that puts like the brakes on dopamine so it doesn't continually be reduced. So if something like an opioid comes into, this, into the body, what an opioid can do is when it binds to a neuron, it inhibits the release of GABA. And if there's no GABA, then dopamine continues to be uh, released and, and it, it's, it's released unabated, if you will. And so it causes an increase of it. And with regard to pain, again, this is a brief coverage. You, you would, if, if you were teaching this with the students, either they would have a, a strong background and I'm assuming that you might, uh, you would wanna slow this down. But pain involves like all nerve impulses and action potential. And a neuron at a resting uh, potential membrane potential is negative on the inside and how a nerve impulse begins or the cascade begins is that the negative becomes positive and then that flows down the axon and so basically when an opioid is prescribed to a patient it stops pain by not allowing an action potential to take place and so how does that happen well it keeps the neuron hyperpolarized in other words, it won't allow it to become less negative. And so the way it does that is when the opioid binds to the, the neuron, what it does is it opens up potassium channels, which then causes positive ions to leave. So keeping the, the inside of the cell negative. And then it also closes calcium channels, which then also keeps the cell negative. And so it's considered to be hyperpolarized. And so it's an effective pain medication, very effective. But it's not the only one. And so in terms of when, when you're a physician and you're, you're trying to, uh, to uh, prescribe medication, these are some common medications. There, some of these are um, you can purchase right off the counter and they're effective. Uh, things like Tylenol, aspirin, uh, Advil, and the, the type of pain as you continue to go up in this chart, you can see that opioids are prescribed when the pain is uh, like acute, like following surgery, it's very important. Or uh, like I was mentioning, uh, a trauma patient, or maybe even sadly, um, when someone's in a long-term cancer and they're in palliative treatment and they're in hospice and they're, they, they don't have long to live. And so they're unresponsive to any other uh, treatments, the best way would be, just be to prescribe opioids to them. But for someone who has had trauma and following surgery and you're prescribing them opioids, what you want to know is, do they have a propensity to become dependent on that medication? And, and this is important. So doctors historically have created something called an opioid risk assessment tool, just an opioid risk tool. And they look at when they're talking to the patient about, like, as you can see in the diagram, they look at family history. Is there, um, is there a history of substance abuse? What is the age of the patient? Uh, is there any other sort of uh, psychological uh, abnormalities in the patient? And so when you're discussing this with the student, what Biorad has created is they've created these cards and they have different scenarios and they have different ages, different genders and different scenarios, because you can go over this with the students and they're like, yeah, I get it. Um, you would rate, give them certain values and, and things like this. But then when you pass out these cards and it's like, OK, um, you know, here's a college football player or here's a, a, a skiing uh, injury that has uh, torn ligaments and, or here's a football player that, that is recovering and they're, they're a male. And so each student or in groups fill out 
this chart and they come up with a risk assessment, whether or not uh, the opioid should be prescribed or not. And so it's kind of fun. The students really get into this. They start to um, feel for the, for the, for the patient and the card, and they really start to, um, you know, participate actively in this. And so um, when, you know, you get into this, the questions come up, like, how useful is this though? I mean, can, like, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this type of evaluation? I mean, really? I mean, you could ask, you know, how effective is this? And so I want to show you a little bit of an, uh, a short clip of a typical um, card that, is, that a student would be inter interacting with. And here's a story of a real life person. And they're, they're going to describe to you um, how they were um, initially injured and they became surprisingly addicted to opioids. Of all the people who might become a drug addict, Patrick Cronin would seem an unlikely candidate. I was brought up in a great family. We had Sunday dinners, we had church, all that, sports, Catholic schools. And yet, seven months after graduating college, Cronin was so desperate for a high, he did something that he once considered unimaginable, heroin. And I was so sick that day, I said, you know what? I'll never do it again. I'll just do it this one time. By the time he tried that first hit of heroin, he was already addicted to the prescription painkiller OxyContin. He traces that addiction to a football injury. The doctor prescribed Percocets. They dulled the pain, but what Cronin also liked was how they made him feel, stress-free. He convinced his doctor to refill the prescription ahead of schedule. Then a friend offered something even stronger. Once I heard that these OxyContins... Um, well, like Percocets, I was like, yeah, I'll take one, you know. So you think your experience with Percocets set you up to want to take Oxy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Heroin, cheaper and easier to get, ultimately became Cronin's drug of choice. At the height of his addiction, he had dropped 50 pounds. His only focus, getting another fix. Do you have a sense of you know, what percentage of the people you were dealing with who were also using heroin began with a prescribed opiate? 100 percent. When I was doing heroin, there was. Yeah. So, you know, these kinds of in, engaging short videos like this really drive the point home. And at, at, a, at a particular point uh, after a, a period or two of conversation of this, the students are really like engaged. And so the question then comes up, you know, what more can be done? Like is what what tools does a does a physician have at their disposal that they can pr safely prescribe? And so the question becomes either in conversation in class or you can bring it up: Is there a genetic association? Is there a link between something in a person's DNA sequence and opioid addi addiction? That's a very very important question that science is trying to answer currently. I might add. And so what I was mentioning at the top of the presentation is that uh, you have a case uh, group and you have a control group. So the case group is uh, people with the condition you're studying. So these are patients that are addicted to opioids. And the control group would represent another group of similar gender, similar age, uh, similar number. Uh, and, and if you're looking at a genetic marker, do they both possess that genetic marker or does the case group have the genetic marker more than the control group? And when I say genetic marker, I mean a, a particular allele that I'm gonna get into. And so, you know, well, where, where do we begin with this genetic marker? I mean, well, what? I mean, what, what would you look for? And so, you know, what protein, this is what we're talking about, what protein would be a good target for the study? And so, Doctors first began and, and researchers began to look at the dopamine receptor protein at the uh, on the membrane of the dendrite and say like, okay, so what are what are the genes associated with that uh, dopioid receptor protein? And so as it turns out, on the long arm of chromosome 11, there's a region right over here, the DR uh, D2 gene. Uh, these dark regions right in here are the exon areas. Uh, those are the areas in, in the sequence that are actually expressed and the gray is, is intron. And so there's another gene 
called ANKKI. And this is a gene for inside the neuron. It's it's for it's part of the signal transduction pathway. It's a kinase enzyme. Both of these genes are curious in terms of their uh, involvement um, in dopamine regulation and and uh, and all of that involved. So these arrows, one, two, three, four, five, six, point to areas in the sequences that have SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms, and I will get into that. Uh, there are changes in uh, in the uh, allele in in uh, in the sequence, and in particular, I want to draw your attention right here to exon number eight in the ANKK1 gene. So uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism, sometimes just pronounced as SNP, the SNP. When you're looking at a particular sequence of nucleotide base pairs like this, this is uh, the that C right there uh, is the SNP that we're we're looking at in the exon, and so there's a C allele, and there's also a morphism for a T. So there's a base pair substitution. So one uh, allele is a C and the other allele is a T. And so you could have um, a C or a T. And so this is a, the particular area. These underlying areas right here are the, the part of the sequence that the primers would anneal to if you were trying to amplify this particular segment from a patient in order to make many copies through PCR, which is DNA replication, so that you could study that particular SNP. And so it's either a C or a T. And so these are the genotypes. And so when you consider um, come to the screen over here, a, a person, as you know, has a maternal and a paternal chromosomes because we're all diploid. So we're talking about chromosome 11 and we're looking at whether or not if a person has a C or a C, they'd be homozygous C or homozygous T, or they could be heterozygous CT. So they would have C, C here, or, or you would have T, T, or you would have CT. And the DNA would then be collected uh, from the patient. And so what we're looking at again is the long arm of chromosome 11. We're looking at exon eight in particular, the, the ANKK1 gene. And that particular area is 1,451 base pairs. These little arrows are where the primers will anneal or attach. And so we could amplify this particular area to study it using PCR, polymerase chain reaction. So the amplified region in particular though, from here to here is only 532 base pairs. And so that including in there is the CT SNP. PCR, uh, in the slideshow, I'm, I'm not going to show it, but it's very good. Uh, if your students have performed PCR uh, in the past or needed to have some background in it, this is an animation that Biorad has created that is very, very good. Uh, it's so good, I actually think I am going to show it. <laughs> And just because it's 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 outstanding. Just to let you know, one of the strong suits of this kit is that if you don't have a ther thermocycler, it doesn't involve it. It's it's a simulated DNA that has been pre-amplified. And so, but this is showing the students the uh, with the, how PCR works. And so, there's a target sequence. Um, what happens is the the DNA is then heated so that it's denatured. And then it's cooled so that primers will anneal to the area that you want targeted. And then um, that will allow uh, DNA polymerase to come and uh, replicate that particular area. So it's so it's a really cool animation. So I thought I'd show you that. Um, and so after PCR, and this is a thermal cycler. And so basically what we're saying is if we're trying to study the DNA to see if there's a genetic association in a patient, it's rather straightforward. 
you would just ask the the patient to to donate DNA. You would then take that extracted DNA and run it through a thermal cycler and make many copies, make billions of copies of just that area of interest. And the area of interest is, is it a CC, is it a TT, or is it a TC? Because maybe these genotypes might indicate, based on their frequency, uh, an association between that SNP and a person's being uh, dependent on opioids versus a control group that doesn't have that same genotypic frequency. So what happens here is that once that amplicon has been generated and you have billions of copies of it, it's difficult to analyze it uh, because it's a larger piece. And so what has happened is there's a restriction enzyme. I apologize if this is coming out like really aggressively complex, but I'm hope, <laughs> hoping you're with me on this. A restriction enzyme is a enzyme from bacteria that helps them fight against foreign phages and it, it cuts DNA, it's an endonuclease. So the amplicon from is, is called TAC1, it's from Thermo aquaticus. It's actually the bacteria that is famous for producing the DNA polymerase that is often used in PCR but this restriction enzyme, TAC1, recognition sequence is TCGA. And so it will cut when it sees the C allele. And so it'll make a cut into two pieces. And so that's useful because what we really want is to distinguish the C from the T when we're running an agarose gel. And so... The, after the restriction digest, there's going to be two pieces, but the T allele after PCR, when you apply the restriction enzyme, it doesn't cut it and it'll only cut the C. And one way to remember that is that cut is same as with cytosine. So it's C. And so it doesn't cut with T. And so you can apply the restriction enzyme. You can put it in a water bath and treat it, but it doesn't make a cut. So following the restriction digest, um, what you have is when you apply the restriction enzyme is you'll get uh, in the homozygous CC, you'll get small little pieces with the T, it won't cut at all. And with the CT genotype individual, the Cs will be cut and the Ts will not be cut. Now you can't see any of that because it's very small and it's clear liquids. And so this is the point of agarose gel electrophoresis. And so samples come in the kit that have already been uh, amplified with PCR and have already been treated with a restriction enzyme. And they're ready for your students to just simply get them and pipette them into the gel. And so Agros gel electrophoresis, and again, a lot coming at you all at once. I apologize, but, I, but I, hopefully you're following it. Ask questions if, if, you, if you need to, and I'll take questions at the end too. But agarose gel electrophoresis is a way to separate uh, DNA fragments in a, in a sugar gel with an electrical current applied to it because it allows us to see DNA. And what I mean by that is DNA fragments can be separated by size, and, and, and I've been talking about that. DNA, as you may know, has, is negatively charged. It's a polyanion. It has all of those phosphate negative charge functional groups attached to it. And so smaller fragments move through the gel more rapidly than larger fragments. And so this little simulation is kind of cool. It's sort of like students in a, if you have a larger group or even a larger group still like moving through desks in a classroom, the small ones move very quickly, faster than the larger ones. And so that's the basic principle of gel electrophoresis. So if you remember, uh, when you're looking sort of like a sky cam view of a, of a gel, in the first lane, also provided in the kit, is something called the molecular wave 
ladder or molecular white roller. So these are known sizes of DNA that when the students pipette the molecular weight ruler into the first lane and run the gel, do you notice here that this piece right here is 1,000 base pairs? It didn't migrate very far. And this one is smaller, 700, 500, 200, and 100. This ladder allows us to make sure that when we're running patient DNA samples, we're able to judge the length of the, of the fragment. And so the size of the fragment when the C is cut is 284 and 248. And the number of expected, expected bands are two, of course. So when you run the gel, it separates like this. You see here that they're around that area, 284, 248. Now T is 532. The restriction enzyme doesn't cut the T. So we expect a solid piece, one band. And of course, that's what we do see. And notice how it's larger, 532. So right, right there. Now, the CT or heterozygous individual, we might expect, if I were to ask you, you might expect all three. And when you run it, you'd expect three bands. And lo and behold, yes, you do see this. However, that all of that being said, when you actually do it, you only see one band for the CC. And that's because the two fragments uh, are so similar in size, it's difficult for a student gel to differentiate between two fragments that are so very close together. So you need to inform the students that even though there's two pieces there, it's only going to appear as one. So the number of visible pieces is one. In TT, the number of visible pieces is one, but it's larger. And if you're heterozygous, CT, you're going to see two bands. And so provided in the kit is also a CT control. So when you run a CT, it's going to provide two lines. And if it and if the genotype is TT, there'll be a single line and it'll be large. And if the patient is CC, it'll be a single band and a small piece. And so this is the part where once they have the background, then you would get into the into the lab prep. And so um, you can make your own gels. Feel free to ask questions if you have if you want to on this. Um, it doesn't have to be a bio rad particular uh, uh, electrophoresis chamber, but it could be uh, 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 bio rad cells the, uh, a buffer uh, TAE buffer, and it, it sells agarose sugar. And you can make up your own gels, or you can buy prepaid prepared gels. Uh, kind of a funny thing about me with the with the gels i've always found it uh useful and i and i uh for students to prepare their own gels and, and pour and, and pour them and they also i find i don't know if you have a similar experience they enjoy making the gels and uh they feel like they have ownership of it and i said well yeah i, I would tell them listen you gotta no one's gonna be making your gel you gotta learn how to how to do this kind of thing but having worked also in a in a private biotech company in, in Vermont, um, you don't really make your own gels, you order gels. <laughs> it's like no one's no one's wants to put that level of effort in. And the quality is just a little bit better when you buy them. And so I found that to be kind of humorous. <laughs> that but in the kit, um, along comes your molecular weight ruler, your control CT, and many participant samples, and I'm going to come back and talk about that. And these are the patients that that will, you'll be running. Now, in order to load samples, if you had a adjustable professional grade micro pipette, um, that's great, but you don't necessarily need that. You could use a fixed uh, volume one, where you do need tips, or you could even use a um, a disposable transfer pipette plastic and, and load the samples. It, it really will work. Uh, and obviously you need uh, power supply and gel boxes. Um, and gel electrophoresis, the, this is the protocol. You'd be putting 20 microliters of a molecular weight ruler, and then you'd put 10 microliters of all the samples, including the control. And then you'd load them, and then you'd run the 
the gel. Now running the gel, curiously, if you're a, wanting to get this done in a single class period and your class is kind of large, there's ways in, in which you can manipulate the time depending on the concentration of, of the buffer that you're using and the voltage that you're applying to the gel during electrophoresis. I mean, you might think, no way is it going to be 10 minutes or 15 minutes, but it can be. And all you're really looking at are these two lines. And so it's quick. And so you're not really utilizing a whole day just to run the gel. You're really just getting at the results. And then you're spending the majority of your time analyzing those results. So it's really cool. And so um, when the students are ready and they've, they've run the gels, you, you're bringing them back and you're like, okay, is there a genetic association with opioid dependence? That's what the doctors want to know. Can they take a look at a patient and go, listen, do you mind volunteering your DNA? We, we would like to take a look at your, your genotype to, to determine whether or not we need to prescribe this or not. And the patient's <laughs> like, yes. Yes. And, um, it's right before a moment for a question in the chat oh, sure. Yeah, sure. regarding gel electrophoresis. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so Linda asks, um, at 300 volts, does the gel heat up? Am I uh, worried yeah. about, go ahead, go for it. Yeah, yeah, it, do, it does warm up. It does warm up. Uh, and uh, that's the, the most I've ever done. Uh, and it is kind of concerning but it should be fine. Um, to me, uh, 10 minutes is a little too fast. I don't ever need 10 minutes. Like I'm planning my class to do 20 minutes. And so I don't really run gels. I've only run only one, just to be truthful, of, at that at that voltage. At 200 is perfectly fine, but it can take it. It does warm up. <laughs> and as per the concentration of the buffer, uh, yeah. and it, um, so you dilute your buffer to make it run faster. That is That's your question. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. And, um, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, this depends on your students and how, and, and you and how far you want to go with one thing or another, but this is an interesting, you know, lesson in and of itself. If you have students making these buffers or if you have or if you're making them up, or I mean, th these are good sidebar conversations about um, the chemistry involved in uh, in the in the weak acid salt of a TAE uh, buffer. No, I, that's a that's an excellent question. So you know, is there a genetic association? Is the C allele? I mean, um, I mean, do you know? Is the C allele going to be more common in a in a patient that is already addicted to uh or dependent i should say to to uh, an opioid or is the control group going to show the t allele more frequent than the c allele or after running the gel are those two groups going to be equal and you're like how's that going to work well basically we're this is the question like is that it is here it is. Is the C or the T the T allele found more frequently in people that are dependent on an opioid where they put heroin, but compared to other healthy individuals? That's the question. It's it's valid. And we want to know it. And so how are we going to do it? And so this invokes a whole conversation with your, your class about, okay, here we go. We're going to make a, a, a study here. Like how many patients? Three, uh, 500, you know, it's okay. Let's talk about that. Like, okay. So this particular investigation is based off of an actual study that was conducted. And I'll show you that at the, at the very end. And so the allele frequencies in this particular kit match the, the actual study that was conducted. So there's 69 unrelated heroin dependent patients. There's 58 healthy individual age gender match to the case group. And so those are the numbers that we're dealing with there. And so they're numbered and, you know, obviously by, by number, not by name. And so they're, and so the students uh, need to keep track of that. 
And so let me show you a little bit. Um, this is useful to, to make sure this is sort of a check for understanding. So here's your molecular. This is a picture of an actual gel, not an animate. So here's the CT control. Do you notice here, this is the T and this is the C right here. So can someone shout out, like, what do you think the genotype is of patient 142? What is that right there? Who, who, who's this person? Is it, and the possibilities are CC, uh, TT, or CT. Here's a hint. It's a small fragment size. <laughs> suggestive of the fact that it was cut. <laughs> was that the CC? CC is correct. <laughs> and so uh, students are given uh, in groups, they're given samples and they're randomized. And so uh, you as an instructor know, because you're preparing the samples, you know uh, what the genotypes are and whether or not they're uh, or what their genotypes are. And so, you know, are they dependent or is it, it the case study? And so this is a, an example of a, the data table that, that's being provided to the student. And so the student uh, isn't going to do all of these samples. And so the group is broken up. And so this is kind of a cool thing too, because if you've done a lot of group work, um, the group work becomes more that it's very valuable, but it comes even more valuable when they understand the fact that that group has like these four patients and it, they're not just doing their thing over on the, and the other groups are doing different things. Everybody needs to contribute to this. Like every group needs to contribute their genotype to the conversation. And then all of that data needs to be pulled. And what's cool is they understand the value so much that sometimes when they're looking at the gel, I don't even, sometimes they call me over, but sometimes they're calling over their friends from other groups. Hey, can you come over and take a look at this? What do you think this is? Or you come over and verify my gel. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. And so um, I may not have mentioned this, but in order to part of the, the, the kit is that your school, if it's a high school, has been asked to, to help participate in this study along with a local university. So like for here in Vermont, at the University of Vermont. So I tell my students, listen, the University of Vermont is working with some of, the, of, the, of this data and we're working with others and we're gonna put those two things together and compile our class data with the UVM data as well. And so as it turns out, these are the numbers that, that, that come along with it here. Um, so class samples, and here's the university samples right here. And so once the gels have been run, this is where things start to switch between, okay, now that we've collected the data to, okay, let's start crunching it. Let's start to combine the data and let's start our analysis. So first thing first, uh, what's the frequency of the genotype in the control population? And what is the frequency of the genotype in the case study? Now remember the case study is the ones that are dependent. Okay, so let's take a look at this. And so this might be seem simple, but it isn't necessarily to the students. Once they see it, then they're fine with it. But uh, at first, they're a little jittery to this. And so to come up with the genotypic frequency, the number with the genotype over the total. Okay, so if it's CC frequency in, a, in the control, that's the number of CCs in the control group over the total number of in the control group. And so if you put some numbers uh, to this, I'm going a little quickly over this, but it's 27 over 58, which would then be 46%. Okay, so that would be the genotypic frequency of CC in the control population. So once the students get that, then you can have them start to calculate the frequencies of the genotype in the control for CT and also for TT. Okay, so it's the number over the total, number over the total, 
And then same thing over here, number over the total. So you see 29, 52, and, and 18. I don't know if you're if you're looking at this right now and you're and you're trying to think, I wonder if it is there anything having to do with the T or the C or the C. Um, do you see anything jumping out at you here in terms of the frequency of the genotypes? Well, what we can then do is look at the frequency of the allele. Okay, that's this is the frequency of the genotype, but let's look at the frequency of the C, the C allele and the T allele sp specifically. Okay, so allele frequency. So the number of alleles in the control group. Now remember, each individual is diploid, and so you have to do this both for the control group and the case study group. And so we're going to look at the allele frequency for C, and we look at the allele frequency for T, and so. When you're looking at the genotypes, here they are, okay? And then you're trying to move the screen so I can see what I'm doing here. So I'm just going to go over one example of this so that you get a sense of it. So the number of CT, uh, for example, so it's 24, okay? But it's also, there's Cs, okay? So this is the number of C alleles in the control group. Do you notice CC, there's two there. Whereas CT, there's only one, so because the other one's T, so it's 24. But in the CC, it's it's time it's plus two, so it's 27. Okay, and so that's 78. And so the same thing for the T allele. The T is present in the heterozygous and also in the homozygous T. And so when you do these numbers, and you get 78 and 38 and you plug these in, you could start to see and calculate the allele frequency. So it's the number of C alleles in the control group, I apologize for going over this quickly, over the total alleles in the control group, it's 78 divided by 116, and then ultimately it comes down to 67%. So you're, you're asking yourself this question, okay? So if I can come up with the allele frequencies of the C and the T, what's my what's my confidence there? What, is this significant? Am I able to accept or reject uh, 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 the hypothesis that I believe that the C allele is more frequent in the case study group, or I or is my hypothesis that T is more frequent in the case study group than the T and then the C. And so this opens up a, the, the possibility if students have had background in statistical analysis to uh, employ a chi-square analysis to this, to determine whether or not the, the difference is significant. Maybe this would be their first introduction to it and then you'd follow it up in a different activity in the future. But basically we're looking at this and so I'm crunching the numbers kind of quickly here so you can see this. But do you see this? Um, it's suggestive, again, in the in the frequency of the allele in the case population. Do you see here that, I'm just going to point out that T allele there. Do you see that, how it's 40, close to 45%, and it's 32 in the control population? You see that? And also the C is less in the case study. And so it, it brings up the question is how confident are you? Establishing confidence in the data. So now the conversation or the activity moves from, you know, there's a crisis, the opioid crisis. There's a, uh, there's a concern about doctors managing opioid medication. Uh, how do we do it? Uh, is there a genetic uh, association? How do we approach it? Uh, it there's a particular SNP involved in a, in a, in a gene that's associated with dopamine. Uh, let's look at the biotechnology. Let's do PCR. Let's run a gel. Let's look at genotypes. And now let's start to apply chi-square to determine whether or not we're confident or whether or not the data can support or refute any claim. This is it. This is the whole package of science right here in this kit. Uh, it's showing that students 
uh, that science cannot make claims unless the evidence supports it. I mean, it's gold. And so you're looking at uh, data points and you're having them use statistical methods to determine if the differences uh, in the values uh, are, are significant or not, or whether or not they're by chance. And then you can look at probability values, p-values, which is, um, again, a measure of whether or not um, the, the data is um, by chance or if there's uh, significance to it. And so let's see here. So the p-value um, it that's less than than five percent is it's usually considered significant, which means like nineteen out of twenty, the difference uh, or the relationship between the the data is real. And so um, anything lower than that is it makes it even more significant, even stronger. And so it depends on you as an instructor of how you want to go with this. Like, you're like, well, I'm not sure if I want to go so heavy on this on the statistical analysis. I want to go a little bit more on, you know, the upfront or or I want to to emphasize the 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 hands-on gel electrophoresis aspect. It's all available there for you to do. And you can assign it uh, for activities. But these are these are the numbers here that based on actual studies that that have been conducted right here and so we were we were looking here at the the ankk1 uh snip uh, between the cytosine and, and thymine right there and the t allele um seems to be more frequent in the case study group than in the control group it's curious other areas the Dopamine receptor proteins have been studied uh, over here. This is the, the opioid receptor protein that I was mentioning at the top of the presentation. It's also been studied. Students could look up um, in the literature. This is the references here. This particular investigation was based off of a 2018 study. Uh, and so that's where these numbers are correlated with. So the numbers that the students generate in this kit are actual numbers from this particular study, but there's others as well that are going on currently. And what's kind of interesting, the more I get into this myself, it's these particular uh, markers are not just as linked to opioid addiction, but they're also uh, related to alcohol dependence and other types of dependence. Uh, that individuals can do, can uh, find themselves caught up into. And so um, the references are all provided in the kit and there's links uh, to the to the papers if you wanted students to to go in, in, into that direction. But it's pretty cool. Uh, again, it it's empowering to the students when they realize they're doing something that's just recently occurred in science and is so relevant they they feel proud of it um you know it's it's a an, an interesting thing um and you might say to yourself well i don't know it seems pretty good but i'm not sure if i have the background necessary well i mean it, maybe you do maybe you don't and maybe you 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 will i mean it, it just you're asking you need to ask yourself, you know, the students need to be brave. We all need to be brave and we need to read and and, and prepare. And so BioRad is here to help. <laughs> There's resource and downloaded uh, materials on the website on explorer.com. There's a student uh, documents that, that walk the students through and ask really good questions and the instructor guide that has a tremendous amount of background um, that will fill you in. There's also multimedia resources. There's really cool YouTube videos that walk the students through the protocols step by step. Uh, and so the, the kit, uh, if you look at just the samples, meaning like the AT, uh, not the AT, but the TC allele. So the DNA, the, the control, and the molecular weight ruler, um, uh, you can purchase that. 
uh, it doesn't include any of, and also microcentrifuge tubes, it doesn't include um, any of the electrophoresis material. But say you needed some agros gel or some buffer and some stain, uh, it's available. And so there's different iterations of the kit. You might say, all I need is the DNA and I'm, I'm really ready to go with this kit. That's pretty good. Or actually I could use a little bit more buffer and, 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 uh, and sugar. And if you wanted to use uh, BioRad's U-View, in other words, um, you don't want to use the, the, the fast blue stain, you could, um, this is really bias, really cool. You add this as, as a loading die instead of the, the normal loading die. And then when you run it, uh, and you just pay, place the gel on the uh, ultraviolet illuminator and it, it shows up and you don't need to stain because the staining takes a little while afterwards, but this is really cool. And so uh, does it meet learning objectives? I mean, it, of course it does. It's, it's, it's linked to, um, to all different uh, learning objectives uh, that you're particularly trying to, to hit at at your school, but more importantly, it's emotionally engaging and, and very important. Um, I just wanted to sort of wind down a little bit that I was talking to to Mika at the at the top of this presentation that um, you know schools are receiving uh, Narcan, which is a um, a nasal spray that um, chemically binds uh, to the uh, to the opioid receptor, similar to to it, and therefore it helps um, knock off the op opioid and it prevents overdosing, and so. Um, it's now over the counter. And so you could purchase this without a prescription and schools are uh, are stocking up on this as well. And so um, I put a link in the slideshow to, this is just a couple of weeks ago, this is September 6th. There's a video on CNN on how to uh, use a Narcan uh, nasal spray. And I don't know, uh, it's, it's, it's somewhat, it, it makes me nervous that, um, uh, but basically it's important uh, and students are, um, you know, working with things that are current, working with maybe they know someone um, who um, personally uh, is dependent or someone who is suffering from it, or um, at the very least, it'll make them a lot more tolerant and understanding and it's not a matter of 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 willpower or um or lack of uh of strength but there's real neurobiology behind addiction and there's real science trying to help those patients i mean it's it's uh it's our mission to be compassionate and try to help others through biotechnology and, and it, it's we're doing it. And um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, when you raise the stakes this high in class, uh, this this lesson, as you, I'm just going to say, will not be forgotten. Will not be forgotten. And when parents come in and, you know, parent conferences and things, they're like, what's going on in class? I'm like, what? <laughs> and they're like, boy, my kid is like talking about opioids and talking about this cool study that you that you were doing in class and I go yeah yeah and there's other things that we've done that were maybe in my judgment similarly cool and you know my nerdy biotech world you know oh, we're, we're doing this and this but what they're talking about and what they're talking about with their parents is this yeah that's that's telling Okay, I'm gonna open it up. <laughs> I'm gonna open it up here, so don't be shy. Absolutely, there were a couple of questions coming through, and I just um, directly addressed those questions um, with individuals. But what I a question I did find interesting that maybe you like to kind of engage the remaining participants. The question that Sid asked: um, Have you heard of any instructors modifying this experiment to run PCR in the restriction digestion steps on student samples, so actual student samples? Yeah, yeah, 
you know, there's there's some things that are that can you know run run in your way there a little bit. I think students have to be at least 18 to make a help man on that, and or they have to have parental permission. What what you'd want to then be able to do is you'd have to get access to the primers involved for the, for that particular Exxon 8 uh, that I that I was talking about. But if you were able to get to the primers, and, and I guess those, if you went to the actual paper for the, the study was conducted, probably has those primers in there, or so you can contact the researcher. You could amplify that DNA and, and then treat it with that, uh, with TAC1 and and run it, but ooh, uh, there's other places and other kits that I do like to run student DNA and do PCR and look at genotype. And but this one, that's a lot to lay on a person. Um, just say that's a personal opinion. It, it's not impossible, but it's a lot. That's a lot to take in if you, if, it's especially if someone has uh is, is a tt individual and because ultimately uh it because there's a genetic association doesn't mean that they're going to become dependent you have to it it's an environmental thing you have to take the opioid you don't just become addicted you have to you know, obviously like alcohol it, if you don't consume it then you're not going to become dependent on it but I, I'm intrigued by it, and and it, it's what students. It's a good question. Students, uh, I can't remember specifically uh, if a student asked if if they could do their own DNA or not. <laughs> I can't recall that. But there's been other times where they've said that it's not impossible, but I I would recommend against it. <laughs> right. My understanding is that um, some of the companies that actually do genome analysis, twenty three andme et cetera, et cetera. They actually do if you request <laughs> um, analysis of this particular SNP, but that's going that route, right? And that's, you know, keeping you exempt <laughs> from any kind of liability, <laughs> you know, within that. And so that's something that could be recommended otherwise if they wanted to know it. Yeah. I like it though. I wouldn't like necessarily if a student was bringing this up, I'd say, listen, you know, everything is in front of you. Um, you know, like even though we may not be able to conduct it in in our lab here because of whatever reasons, it doesn't mean that it can't happen in your future uh, if you're interested in it. I mean, I would never discourage anyone. And it, it's it's like that that's the type of question where someone's really, really into it. And so 